It's the 1970s. Throughout the decade, Americans are confronted with profound historical events. A divisive war, political turmoil, a brutal energy crisis, and a stifled economy. However, for the people of one hard-working, close-knit community, each new workday provides a sense of continuity, pride, and opportunity as they go about their daily business. The business of building America's most advanced and powerful ships. The year 1978 was especially significant for a select group of young shipbuilders. Although they could not have known it at the time, that year set the stage for many long, distinguished careers at Ingalls Shipbuilding. Today, we honor that journey and recognize the important contributions made by the Ingalls Shipbuilding 2018 Master Shipbuilders. When I was a little kid, I'd be out in the yard playing and I could hear that shipyard whistle blow. It's a funny thing. It might have been calling me. I came one summer, 76, to babysit for my sister from Opelousas, Louisiana. Went to school my last year of high school in Moss Point High and then um, work, wound up working here at Ingalls. Well, you always thought about coming to Ingalls. Everybody, you know, that you graduated with or whatever wanted to come to Ingalls. Uh, that was uh, where you knew you could be stable, you know, and get something and make something of yourself. I was in Big Spring, Texas, graduated high school out there, came back to Mississippi to help take care of my mother and uh, wound up finding out about the apprenticeship program here at Ingalls. I told the supervisor when I came in that uh, don't worry about me, I'm gonna be here about six months. When I get enough money to go back to Texas, I'm going back to Texas. Well, I never went back to Texas. <laughs> I'm still here. I applied for the job not knowing a whole lot about shipbuilding or anything of that nature. And when I actually got the job and got here and got to send it all, I kind of felt this is where I need to be, you know. I applied at Ingalls because my father, Glenn Bjork, was a marine engineer here, and he'd suffered a heart attack at work. And my mother called and asked me to move here and be with her while he underwent bypass surgery. So I did, I moved from Atlanta and came here and uh, hired in at Ingalls and thought I would be here about six months. So 40 years later and, and I'm still here. My first day at the shipyard, wow. I tell you, it was something, because once I walked through those gates, when I seen the steel, and they take the steel, the beginning of the ship, and then I saw the results at the end, I say, wow, people right here in Mississippi make that ship. I was scared to death. Uh, I was very intimidated. Uh, I looked around and all I saw was all this steel and I did not know what in the world I'd gotten myself into. I hired in at Ingalls as a typist in the typing pool. It was just a sea of, of ladies typing furiously on manual typewriters and nobody was smiling. <laughs> so I thought at the time, what, what have I gotten myself into? A few days after I started working, I was working in a PC trailer and some guy called on the phone and said, would you put your uh, receiver, phone receiver in the garbage can because we're uh, testing the carbon in the line. So that was a joke for the new employee. We had these uh, uh, capacitors for points at the time and they would charge them up and they'd walk by and say, hey, catch up, you know, and they'd toss it to you and you reach and catch it with your hand and that thing would light you up, you know. <laughs> The big thing was to take C5A or Cosmolube and they would put it on the handle of your lunchbox or on your wrenches. They'd put it somewhere to where you wouldn't know it was there. And when you reached in your bag to get it, you would wind up with a handful of this stuff all over your hands. You can take one drop of that and paint one of these ships out here with it. That's just how bad it is. You get it on you and it it's on you everywhere. In 1978, the median household income was about $15,000. The cost of buying a new home averaged around $55,000. A first-class postage stamp rose from 13 to 15 cents. 
The best-selling passenger car in the U.S. was the Chevrolet Impala Caprice with a base model sticker price around $5,800. And the average price of a gallon of regular unleaded gasoline was 68 cents. In 1979, I purchased my first car that I purchased on my own. Uh, was a 77 Nova. I loved it so much that uh, that car so much that I'm now restoring the 1978 Nova. I had a 64 Chevrolet Del Air, and that was my way in and out of the shipyard. And being that it was a standard, it was, by the time you got out in the daytime, your legs was give slam out from having to pull up an inch or so and push in on the clutch, and then you go a little further and you go, but when the traffic got out, it was, it was every man for itself, and it was really bad. If you failed, you probably would get stepped on seven or eight times before you was able to get up. It was stressful, but you know, it all worked out. We all found parking places and were able to get to our jobs and on time. At Ingalls, our young shipbuilders were learning the ropes. While the early part of the 70s was devoted to implementing modular ship construction, the second half of the decade became a testament to the shipyard success. We was putting out ships uh, I've seen the dock as many as eight ships docked at the ship at one time that we was working on them. We had gangplank from one ship to another one that you'd have to walk on to get over to the next one to work on them. We had them stacked up just that way around here. When I was in the apprentice program, I got moved around. I got I got done fair. I got done right. Some foreman's giving me merit raises, and there was a raise before you even got your next uh, apprenticeship raise. and. Uh, I even went on sea trial when I was in the apprentice program, LHA-5, so that was an experience there. A clerk, then I went to a junior clerk, senior clerk, specialist, went to analyst, and uh, now manager, so I have several positions here at Ingalls. Worked uh, the DDs, the CGs, DDGs, LHAs, oil rigs, uh, some of the LPDs. Uh, did a stint in accuracy control and uh, worked also as a supervisor in the pipe shop for a couple of years and most recently went to production control and then I just transferred into the PDA group uh, with planning. I uh, started off as a warehouse clerk and then went to a uh, paint clerk and then I also now I'm at uh, progress coordinator slash administrator yet to a director. I was given opportunities to be a part of something bigger than just typing. Uh, when they finally went to computers, I had some computer experience from Atlanta. And so I was able to move into a lead role with that and, and step by step I was able to, to move up in the company and, and do some things that were exciting and wonderful. Once I got into the shipyard, I, I never looked back. I, I mean, I, I always kind of knew that th this is where I was going to be, especially when I got where I was into the GFE group. It's a new day every day, so I've really enjoyed being with that group. One of uh, the fondest memories that I have when Michelle Obama came to christen the NSE 3 because it was a historical moment, you know, the first black female first lady and the Ingalls choir sang so I was in the Ingalls choir we were able to uh, participate in it and that was a great event. I met some real important people here through christenings and stuff like that. I've met John Stennis, I've met Trent Lott. My heroes, the real heroes are World War II veterans, the Vietnam veterans and people that come to these uh, christenings and these commissionings and stuff and it's, it's a long story behind some of that stuff. You really meet some interesting people here and you make some friends. Then we did the uh, Iowa and the Wisconsin, but to actually be able to walk out there to see it or go aboard it meant a lot. And that stays with me all the time that I actually got a chance to walk aboard that particular ship that so many people served on way before I was ever born. You know. When the USS Cole came in, um, limping and, and wrecked, and um, we were, many of us were at the waterfront, and there were tears in our eyes when we saw our ship come in that way. And then, of course, we repaired it and sent it on its way again, and we were back at the waterfront smiling and crying again, but waving our flags and, and just happy that our company is able to do such enormous things 
for our military. It's just the enormity of what we do um, is just something you cannot imagine unless you, you become a part of it. As true today as it was back then, shipbuilding is hard but rewarding work. And the wages in 1978 were among the best for those ready to start a family of their own. The USS Brooks pulled in one day and uh, I met my future husband and that was in 1986. So a couple years after the Spruance pulled in, we got married and we decided to get us a house. What long after that, we started our family, had got two boys. My son worked here as a, a shipfitter, so uh, he's becoming a part of the Ingalls family. Uh, my other son is Navy, he's military. He's a pilot with the uh, Navy. So we owe a lot to this, I mean, uh, it's been really good to us. I met my husband here. We've been married 37 years. We have three kids, two teachers, and I have one that's presently working here. And actually, he served in the U.S. Navy, and he actually sailed on one of our ships, the Yorktown, CG-48. And so that's why it's important for us to put our all in all in building these ships, because we don't know who may serve on one. A lot of people say, well, I was lucky, but uh, actually it was blessing. Uh, later I married my wife, which was a school teacher for uh, Creole Elementary. Uh, we had four kids. The money allowed me to be able to send my kids to school, provide for those kids. I was able to send all my kids to college. It's a lot of things that I had dreamed of doing, I've been able to do it. And it's been because of the yard. In 2010, I got my bachelor's degree in uh, business administration. And now in May of this year, I'll have my MBA through the Education Assistance Program. My grandkids think, Grandma, you're going to school? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> of course, it's not all hard work. 1978 offered plenty in the way of entertainment during off hours. Blockbuster hit film Saturday Night Fever paved the way for the golden age of disco, and fashion was never the same. Another John Travolta smash hit, Grease, shattered box office records and still ranks as the highest grossing musical film to date. It was April 2nd, 1978, when a new miniseries made its debut on CBS. That show was Dallas, the most successful primetime soap opera in TV history. In sports trivia, during a 1978 Monday Night Football game, Howard Cosell made numerous references to a plate of nachos he was enjoying. Cosell continued to spread the word for several weeks, pushing nachos into the mainstream as a new favorite stadium treat. On the technology front, the Department of Defense launched the first of a constellation of satellites that later became the foundation of GPS. NASA's astronaut class of 1978 included Sally K. Ride, who became America's first woman in space, and Guion S. Bluford, Jr., America's first African-American astronaut. The world has changed dramatically over the last four decades, and shipbuilding has evolved to face the constant challenges. It's unbelievable to see today and look back 25, 30 years ago. We used to stay on a unit four, five days when we set it. Now we're setting twice the size of the units, half the ship most of the time on the smaller ships and we're doing it with uh, about three lifts. And it's, it's in place and we're waiting for the next spot. Over the years, there have been many changes in the shipyard. Um, of course, safety has taken some long strides in making improvements. We have a wonderful safety department. In leadership now, we have more ladies. So that's a good thing. A female can do a good job if you give her the opportunity. First, you have to have the opportunity, and once you get in that position, do your best. Don't get in there and linger, but do your best that you can do. And so it's important. Give us a chance, and then we'll show you what we can do, you know? New guys that come in, I, I try to help them, show them the ropes, and show them how we used to do it and how we do it now, and just, uh, just, kind, of, just kind of be a mentor like I had mentors. Today, as Ingalls celebrates a remarkable 80-year legacy, we honor our master shipbuilders 40 years of commitment to delivering quality ships to the Navy and Coast Guard. Our success is only possible because of your dedication and leadership. It is a milestone. 
Uh, it's something in my life that I'm very proud of. I guess of all the things that my mom was a fan of on December 18th of every year, I got a phone call. Sometimes it, she would forget my birthday, but she didn't forget December 18th. A company that's been around for 80 years, the longevity is an inspiration. You're always running to the TV. Is that one of ours? You know, you're always looking to see which one it is. Uh, proud, uh, yeah, that, that you were a part of that. My wife and I would be watching TV and we'd see one of the ships go by and the number on us, look. That one was built there at Ingalls. That's one of our ships we built, you know. And she said, how you know I said, I can remember the number, you know, and just look at it. I said, that's the best they got on the water. It makes me feel good that I've been here 40 of the 80 years that the shipyard's been here. I want it to last. I want it to be where my, my son or my grandsons, and I, I, they would be proud to be on that ship. To my fellow master shipbuilders, I would say bravo, Zulu, to you and I just congratulate you on your 40 years. On behalf of the entire Ingalls Shipbuilding team, thank you for 40 years of dedicated service. You have earned the honor to join an elite group. You are indeed master shipbuilders.